Hello! I am back with a highly requested tutorial and some information about body casting, specifically how I make my vulva casts. Although I highly recommend those of you who are interested in getting cast, find a local professional body caster in your area like myself. I've had a lot of people reach out who are not local to me asking, hey, how do I cast myself at home? I'm from a small town, no one in my area has something like this available. So I am here to share with you guys all of the tips and tricks I've learned along the way um, from casting vulvas for over two years now. And I'm so excited to help you guys on this journey of celebrating your body through the art of body casting. Those of you who are new here, welcome. My name's Janelle Kinsey. I'm a queer feminist artist and body caster. I specialize in making live cast vulva pottery where I cast people's vulvas and turn them into functional art. I am so excited to share with you guys a little glimpse into part of my process and help you learn how to cast vulvas. It's important to note that all of my artwork is built upon clear and enthusiastic consent. The person who you're seeing participate in this video is over the age of 18 and actively and enthusiastically consented to the creation of this footage. Like any good tutorial, we're gonna start off with sharing what supplies you're going to need to get started. So you're going to need at least two buckets or uh, old Tupperware you don't care about. You're going to need to get some alginate and plaster bandage. Both of these I get online. My alginate is Alja Safe from Smooth On. You're gonna need some gloves and some baby wipes to help with cleanup. You're going to want some scissors to help cut your plaster bandage. A plastic tarp and immersion blender and then you're going to want to gather whatever medium you're going to cast your vulva out of. I use plaster because that's what I'm familiar with and then I also use clay to help build a mold around the alginate. You also could use something similar like play-doh or air dry clay. The very first step in this process for me is just creating my space. So I will put some comfy blankets down and then place the big plastic drop cloth on top of that and gather all my supplies. Then I will start cutting my plaster bandage strips so they're right there ready for me to use. The length you cut them is gonna be dependent on the size of your vulva, um, but typically you're gonna need anywhere from three to four uh, for one vulva cast. It's during this time that you're going to want to fill your buckets, one with ice cold water to use with the alginate, and the other, any kind of water will do for your plaster bandage. Then you're going to take a scoop of alginate. You're going to not need as much as you think, just a little scoop will do. And then you're going to start pouring that ice cold water into your alginate. You can see mine even has chunks of ice. Don't worry about it. We're going to mix it all up. I use an immersion blender. I've seen some people use popsicle sticks or a whisk. I find an immersion blender gets the job done best, but keep in mind you're going to have to tap it around um, after you mix it to make sure you release any air bubbles that we're creating through this mixing process. Your alginate will come with instructions for how to measure and use it. I tend to eyeball things, so um, I do this all by eye. Uh, you're going to kind of slowly add water in to the powder until you get sort of a loose jelly type of uh, consistency but it's something that with experience I've learned I don't need to measure I find it to be easier for me just to do it by eye and by feel after using the immersion blender I'll mix with my hands a little bit and I'm gonna wait and watch for the alginate to get to a consistency that I know is ready to pour over the vulva for me I'm able to tell just by watching how long it takes for it to flow down when it starts to kind of take a little bit more time to drip back into my cup that's when I know it's ready to pour over onto my client and it's going to cure relatively quickly 
I'll pour the alginate over the vulva fairly generously. When it first touches the vulva, it is kind of cold, but your body temperature helps warm it up and aids in that curing process. Any of you who have been to a gynecologist appointment or a waxing appointment, I think will find that vulva casting is a lot less invasive and painful and a lot more fun. Keep in mind that alginate does tend to stick to hair, so although I wish I could say that I can cast any and all amounts of body hair, uh, trimmed or shaved pubic hair tends to leave a cleaner cast with less texture and less air bubbles. I'm then going to place a plaster bandage over that alginate that we poured over. The first one will go on dry and I'll gently press it into the alginate ensuring that it sticks. And then I will take the other plaster bandage strips, dip them in some water and place them on top. The plaster bandage never touches the vulva directly. It always goes over the alginate and it's just there to give the alginate casting a little bit more strength since alginate is so delicate and fragile. From here, we're going to wait for our alginate and plaster bandage to dry and cure a little. A lot of this is going to depend on the temperature of the air around you and your body heat. I find that it takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes to be ready to pull off. You'll be able to tell that it's ready to come off when when you touch the alginate, it no longer will move, but it'll hold its shape like a hard jelly. When it is time to remove the casting, I make sure I'm informing my client of every step of the way. I'll let them know, hey, it's time to take your casting off and let them know that I'm gonna be placing my hands close to their vulva there. I'm going to shake and agitate the uh, casting a little bit just to remove any um, parts that might be stuck on or caught on body hair, being really delicate and gentle here to ensure that we have the cast come off as one full piece. Again, I've been doing this process for a while, so I am able to have a clean and successful cast on the first try. Those of you who are attempting something like this at home, uh, expect it to take a few attempts, especially if you've never done any kind of body casting before. This is what a successful casting will look like. It'll come off as one solid piece. Uh, keep in mind, this is the negative. So we cast it from your positive body. This is the negative impression. So in order to create something that looks like your vulva, you're going to have to pour your medium on top of that negative cast. In order to do that and make it easier for myself, I build what I call a moat out of clay around that alginate casting. Now, this is something that's particular to my process as a ceramicist. Um, I use ceramic clay, that's what I'm comfortable with. I know a lot of body casters, especially body casters who use plaster, will skip the step entirely, wait for the plaster to do what we call frosting, where it's thick enough to hold its shape on its own, and pour it directly on the alginate without creating this extra mold. Um, this is something that I do for my process. I find it to be easier and it helps me make a cast that works for my needs but feel free to play around and try what works best for you. Make sure if you are using clay like this that you're taking your time sealing all of the cracks and crevices and making sure that there's no place for the plaster to seep out and create what we call a plaster disaster. Now, since I am using plaster as my casting medium, I know that when I pull it out of my mold, I'm still going to be able to shape it and um, clean it up using a sure form or even just a metal rib. But to make it easier on myself, I will smooth out my clay as much as possible. Now, anytime we're using plaster, we're always going to use a handy dandy respirator. We care about safety folks. If this is your first time using plaster, I highly recommend that you do some research um, on your particular plaster and learn a little bit about how to mix it up properly. I do everything by eye and I create what's called an island. So I'm mixing up the plaster into a bucket of warm water until it no longer settles at the bottom but starts to settle on the top and form what we call an island. After I start to see a peak of an island form, I'll pour a few more cups of plaster just for good measure. And then before mixing, I'll let it sit for two to five minutes just to let that water soak in the plaster. 
I'm then going to mix plaster by hand. As I'm mixing, I'm going to agitate the plaster to help release any air bubbles by lifting my fingers up in this motion that I'm demonstrating here. We're mixing the plaster by hand anywhere from 15 to 20 minutes. We're waiting for the plaster to create what I would call a peanut butter or a thick frosting texture. This is something that I know what it feels like from experience, but one way to test if your plaster is ready to pour is if you can drape a finger on top of it and it'll leave that mark. When your plaster is ready to pour, do so slowly and gently. Again, we're trying to avoid air bubbles. I happen to measure my plaster out perfectly just from experience and doing it by eye. Those of you who are A-type brained might find it useful to measure, but also if you have leftover plaster, you can just quickly dump it in a trash can. It's no big deal. After I've poured my plaster out, I'm going to shake the board that I built my moat on, just releasing any other air bubbles. I'll do this for just a little bit until I stop seeing air bubbles rise up to the surface. If you're wanting to reuse your bucket for plaster for future use, you can rinse it out with a sponge. If you don't have a clay trap or a sediment trap like I have here, because you're not a studio potter, please don't dump this water down your drain. Dump it into a trash can. It's never a good idea to pour plaster down your drain. It will clog your pipes. After about another 20 minutes of waiting for the plaster to cure, it's likely ready to remove from the mold. You'll know your plaster is ready for the mold to be removed is when you feel it and it feels warm and sweaty to the touch. That means the plaster has gone through the chemical change it needs to and it's hardened enough for you to remove your mold. I would recommend trying to do this process slowly and carefully, but keep in mind the clay and alginate are much softer than the plaster, so don't be too nervous to pull off your mold. When you do peel off your alginate, it is okay if you see some bits of alginate that get stuck in the plaster mold. That's completely normal. The alginate will slowly start to dry up over time and be easy to remove. You also can take some carving tools, simple carving tools, and help clean it up after you've removed your mold. So now it's time to just start cleaning up our mold here. I'll do so with some simple carving tools, a sure form, a metal rib, just to clear off any uh, rough surfaces, any air bubbles that might have gotten captured in the mold. That's pretty normal with this process. Um, and just putting on any final touches while our plaster is still soft and has not fully cured, which it will do over the next week. Thanks guys for watching. I hope this video was helpful for those of you who are interested in what the process might look like to get cast by me or interested in maybe attempting to cast yourselves at home. Let me know how that process went for you. Hopefully this video gave you some insight and some valuable resources. You can find more information about my work and more information about body casting in general on my website as well as poke around, see what kind of services I offer, and maybe explore some other queer feminist art content, if that's the kind of thing you're into. Again, this has been Janelle Kinsey. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and happy vulva casting.